Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out and those that have joined us on Zoom. Uh, our speaker tonight is Jerry Snow. Um, Jerry grew up in Portland, Oregon, and became a professional student with two master's degrees and a PhD in the fields of zoology, botany, ecology, and environmental health. He taught at several colleges and universities. <clears throat> After moving to Arizona, he has worked for the city of Flagstaff part-time in the parks and recreation, is a docent at the Museum of <clears throat> Northern Arizona, excuse me, my voice is cutting out, and has been a tour guide for the Road Scholar Program with NAU. His hobbies are astros, archaeoastronomy and reenacting historical characters from the 19th century. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Jerry. And whenever you're ready to start up your PowerPoint, yeah, just tell let's me. go. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Let's share your screen. Uh, share your slide. There it is. Right? Yes. So does everybody see this? Uh, Okay. Oh, you can point with the oh yeah with okay. the mouse. Yeah. Cool. And uh, when you want to, I can add, just click to go to the next one. Yeah, or the space bar. Yeah. All right. Okay. This is an architect who uh, presented this probably at a meeting. These are two five hundred room pueblos on a ridge at Chavez Pass, site occupied, let's say 1100 to 1400, just in round numbers. Um, each one of these uh, buildings, Pueblos, uh, had about 500 rooms. So we say maybe, uh, I don't know, one or two people per room to estimate population there. That's a lot of people. And uh, they've got to have fields to feed all these people, corn, beans, and squash, call it the three sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, the site that I'm going to be talking about, let's see, is right about here. See where the pointer is? Mm -hmm. And that's the south end of Anderson Mesa, which is a large, Mesa uh, south and um, a little to the east from Flagstaff. And over at the, uh, just on the horizon over there, right there, that's the San Francisco Peaks. So when I drive out there, uh, I come out on Interstate 40 going east, then go turn off at the uh, road that goes to Meteor Crater. And before the road turns to go to Meteor Crater, you just keep going straight and you're on a dirt gravel road for about 20 to 25 miles. And then you get south and you're in Chavez Pass. I'll show a little bit more of that uh, later. Okay, there's a sign right there. This is on the Coquinito National Forest. And uh, I don't uh, profess to pronounce Hopi correctly. So I'll just let you see the first word there, Nuva, that means snow. And the rest of it has to do with describing a snow belt because this uh, mesa is very long, north and south. And uh, in the wintertime, there's just enough elevation rise on the mesa that the snow will be there, but not below. So it just looks like a white belt going across the landscape. So that's the Hopi word for it. It says there are remains of a prehistoric ball court. Well, there was always a, a disagreement between the Coconino County, no, the Coconino National Forest Archaeology, Peter Pillis, and uh, the archaeologist uh, at the Museum of Northern Arizona. He's passed away now. But uh, 
they both disagree on what, uh, but I like the idea uh, that uh, my friend at the Museum of Northern Arizona, he says that's a burrow pit. They are building these puzzles up to three stories tall on the back wall with uh, irregular stones that are very difficult to shape because they're basalt, volcanic, very hard volcanic rock. They built up to three stories. It would take a lot of mortar to make walls with that material. And so there's a big pearl pit. Uh, he said that's where they got them the mortar to build these buildings. <clears throat> it, to me, it doesn't look anything like a ball court, but whatever. Now, I'm standing at the sign there down in the lower right, and up on the ridge, you can see something that looks like it might be the top of the ridge. That's not the top of the ridge. That's the top of the third floor uh, wall. Uh, bubbles on the ridge. Now, these have all tumbled down. There, there, there's been no maintenance there since about 1425. So, and nobody's putting mortar back in there to hold these rocks together. So, it's all kind of crumbled down. The next picture shows a... Uh, what happened? It's not moving. Oh, oh yeah. I'm going to be on. Oh, okay. So... <clears throat> This is part of the petroglyph panel that's up on, on the ridge, south ridge, overlooking these, to the south, overlooking these two 500-room pueblos. And uh, part of what I'm going to talk about has to do with this spiral here. You see it has tick marks on the outside. Now, there's about 22 of those tick marks. And it takes uh, for the shadow line to go across that from top to bottom. It takes about 44 days. And I don't know if that, you know, 22 times 2 is 44. I don't know if there's any connection there or not. Uh, but uh, anyway, I want you to notice, uh, where's the point? Here's the pointer. Look at this back here. Looks like a turtle. Yes, that's a turtle. Pakti clan, clan symbol. Pakti is the water clan at Hopi. And they are still today the calendar keepers at First Mesa. You know, there's three mesas, first, second, third mesas at Hopi. They're the sole calendar keepers at first mesa, still today. Wow. And that's their clan symbol. Uh, my friend uh, Brian Bates um, worked on a site at Wupapki National Monument, another calendar site. And at the front on the mesa, there was another symbol like this another turtle, <clears throat> calendar keepers. And in the oral history, they say that their clan came up from the south. First, they went to this site. After this site, they moved to both Omalavi and to Wupapki. And uh, I don't know if they had any calendar functions at uh, Omalavi. But uh, they certainly did at uh, at uh, Wupaki National Monument. That's a close up. Now, how do I know it's a turtle? Well, they they show a lot of creatures that sometimes we call lizards because they have long tails, and they have the back legs go down, the front legs go up. Turtles in normal position always the hind legs are going up and the front legs mm. and the they have a sh short a narrow neck and a head on it and they have a short tail uh, it's a turtle okay now here i am sitting on a rock you, on the right side you, you can kind of make out the spiral over here and you see, oops, let's go back. How do I go back? Uh, <clears throat> and you see a straight line right there. That's a shadow line going right through the center of the spiral. That shadow line is made by this rock right here. That rock, this is basalt, volcanic basalt. 
The salt does not break into curves. It breaks into straight edges, and their edges are smooth. They're not like this, okay? That's worked. That that's throwing a shadow line there has been worked so that the sun, as it clears the horizon and starts shining across there for the shadow line, makes a straight line. I'll talk more about how they might have put this all, made this all together. I'm sitting on the shadow throwing rock, taking a picture. This is in February. So it's a little cold there. This elevation is almost 7,000 feet. But in the distance, you can see some open areas where there's no pinyon juniper growing. And those are probably uh, ancient fields where they were growing some of their crops. Now this is a better view of the uh, little warmer temperature. Um, this is another view of the uh, sun dagger on this rock. Now after you know this this rock that throwed the shadow line before that only works for a certain amount from about last week in January until about the um, see, about the end of April. Okay, but summer solstice is in June, around June twenty first, and the shadow line here about a month month and a half before. Summer solstice, back in May, the shadow line starts at the top of the spiral here. And every day it moves a little bit down, keeps on going down, until it finally stops at the tangent to the fourth ring down. I'll show you a picture of that. So across there from the, for about a month and a half, that shadow line at sunrise, that sun dagger comes down and stops for a week and then moves back off into August. So it's going. You need to put the pointer oh, yeah. out here before you so, click it. Yeah. Yeah, let's uh, close that down. Yes. So here is another shadow line, pretty straight, right across the center. That's coming off of that rock that I was sitting on. That uh, comes across the center there. It's about 20 two days uh, yeah 22 days after the shadow line first appears up here not the dagger but this shadow line and here it is getting closer to coming off the spiral it's getting close to some other elements here I think the next one I'm going to talk about is this hook cross right here well there's the whole panel so the spiral here, seven turns counterclockwise. Now, one of the Hopis which is interested in some of this stuff has told me that spirals that are counterclockwise like this represent life or when they came from the underworld into this world. They say we're living in the fourth world. And uh, that's kind of the idea. If the spiral, and there are spirals that go the other way, that represents death and you're going back into the underworld. Mm -hmm. Heaven for the Hopis and traditionally for all the Pueblo people is down there. It's not out there. Okay. Right. So, so uh, we're going to look at this a little more, and then the circle dot, and then this thing here, which I refer to as sun in its house. I don't know, just why I came up with that. I don't know. <laughs> Very descriptive. Anyway, okay, so now that shadow line is tangent to the two left-hand, so, well, the bottom and the left uh, hook on the uh, uh, hooked cross. Now, you notice there's a cupule, just a little dot pecked into the rock up here. Four days before... The shadow line comes here. It goes through this little cupule. So from here to here is four days. And Hopis always announce ceremonies four days in advance. 
so people can get ready for the ceremony. You know, when you have a birthday party, you got to, you know, invite people and make sure everything, you know, start preparing ahead of time. So at Hopi, it's, everything happens in fours or multiples of fours. So the Potke clan, uh, this is from their oral history, which was actually published in a, in a book uh, that a Anglo guy wrote the book, but he interviewed the Hopi. Um, and the book is called uh, Big Falling Snow. But his father was Potke clan and was born in the 19th century. And he told about the story of the Potke clan coming from the south. In the south, there was a big flood. It was called caused by a big uh, water snake or something like that. And uh, a lot of people lost their lives. And uh, after the uh, flood was over, they were given instructions to carry the message about living properly. And so this won't happen again. But go, my, go north and spread the word. You know, let's not have this happen again. Let's behave ourselves. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> my version of the story. <laughs> but uh, actually, on the uh, this is reenacted at night in the Kiva on the spring equinox. Okay. That's what this shadow line marks right there um, at that point is four days before the uh, ceremony is announced. And then that uh, story I just told you is reenacted in the Kiva um, on the equinox, the night of the equinox. Okay. Now I'm looking east here from the petroglyph site. And that uh, right there is East Sunset Mountain. You're going to hear more about it. It's uh, about 15, well, where the pointer is, is about 15 miles east of the petroglyph site. Here is the sun rising over the highest point on East Sunset Mountain. Over here is West Sunset Mountain, and in between is Sunset Pass. Because if you're at the upper end of the pass, looking to the southwest, the winter solstice sunrises in that view of Sunset Pass between those two mountains. Okay, so let's see what's happening when the uh, sun rises over the highest point. Okay, the shadow line. It goes through the middle of what I call sun in its house. Now, I don't, I, I don't know what, why that's important, but I showed this picture and the sun rising in East Sunset Mountain to uh, Lee K1 Yseoma. That's a Hopi name. Okay, <laughs> uh, used to be known as Lee Jenkins, but he changed his name to a, well, he had a Hopi name already, but. Uh, that's that's his opening. I sh I showed this to him. I said, Lee, what do you think is going on here? Sun rises over the highest point on the eastern horizon, and the shadow line goes through what I call sun in its house. And he says, well, uh, there must be a shrine out there on top of the mountain where the sun is. And then he, that, his next words out of his mouth, he says, when are we going there? <laughs> I said, well, Lee, if you know me, I've already tried. You know, you guys own that cattle ranch that includes the mountain. And uh, I talked to the ranch foreman. He says, well, if you had a, a hunting license, I might let you in there because there's lock gates on the road go, going up there. But if uh, you don't have a hunting license, you got to talk to the uh, director of the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office. Oh, you mean Lee K1 Yseoma? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here I'm talking to him, and he says, "When are we going there?" Well, he has no problem. He just already his friend Norman Honani, who's assistant ranch manager, 
he has the keys to the gate. So I met them at the uh, the ranch office. So they, they own three, I hope he's owned three cattle ranches in that area. And uh, I met them on July the 9th, 2004, I believe it was, at the uh, ranch headquarters. And we got into his uh, SUV and we headed out. That's Lee on the left. That's Norman Honani and a young man from Lee's office. And in the right next to Honani, there is a pile of uh, rocks. And they had just finished when I took this picture. Well, they asked me if, Jerry, you want to take a picture of this by our ancient shrine? I said, really? Yeah, sure. And, but before I took this picture, they each individually took uh, cornmeal from their pouch and sprinkled it on that a shrine and said a prayer in Hopi individually. And I was still, when uh, Lee called me, I was still at the top of that second highest point on uh, East Sunset Mountain. I was taking some pictures. And when we got up there, all, all three of us, you can see his SUV down there. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, so. <clears throat> Uh, I there were three fire circles on top of that uh, Mesita Knoll, the second highest point. I says, "Oh, somebody's been ma making uh, smoke signals," <laughs> and uh, and Norman says, "No, we don't do smoke signals. That gives our position away." <laughs> I says, "Well, what do you do? We yell." <laughs> you want a demonstration? I said, sure. Man, he let out a yell that must have carried for miles. <laughs> it was amazing. Anyway, well, they walked on down the slope. Oh, by the way, um, I mentioned to uh, um, Lee, I said, uh, you know, the site that I'm working on is, is Pati, Pati, Pati Clan. I said, if, if you know some elders in Patki clan, uh, ask them uh, about any shrines in the in the area. And so uh, he must have known that we go over sea to know and walk down the west or little ways that you'll find one. And that's the one that they blessed, you know, put the corn meal on and said a prayer and all that. So I was still at the top and Lee calls, hey, Jerry, come on down here. So I said, okay. <laughs> so I walked down and then they were in the process of doing their prayers in the cornmeal on the Karen, rock Karen. And uh, so when they were through, Lee turned around and says, uh, you want to take a picture of us? I said, yeah, sure. So you saw it. Uh, <clears throat> I was amazed. Anyway, so then we uh, walked back down to the to the SUV, and uh, we ate some lunch, and then we were following an old terrible road. At the highest point over here, back in the 70s, uh, somebody had built a radio tower up there, and uh, I had a topo map with me, and I could see the road that went up here, and it went around the backside, and then it went up to to the top over there. It kind of made a little circle around there. So we were going along and we, we couldn't go any faster than you could walk. I mean, that's how rough the road was. And <clears throat> by this time, the radio tower had been taken down. And uh, so you can't see it there. But, um, but on the topo map, it says radio tower. And I've been out there a few years before that, and I noticed there was a radio tower up there. So, so we started creeping along. We finally got to the base of the highest point, and I said, Lee, you know, we can walk up there faster than we can drive around and get up to the top, so let's do it. So we got out. Oh, in the meantime, as we were going along, there was a, a full rack elk that ran across the road in front of us. 
And then the clouds were getting heavier and darker and darker, and we could see some lightning off in the distance. But the lightning was coming toward us, okay? And it was getting, uh, you know, to flash, bang, you start counting seconds, you know, how close is it? Well, we had gotten out of the SUV, and we started up. We were maybe about a third of the way up to the high point, and it was getting flash bang. That's close. <laughs> <laughs> and then it started raining. And we said, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. So we all ran back to the SUV, jumped in, and trying to get off the mountain. It was fine as long as we were on this rocky road. But when we got down, locked the last, the first gate coming down, we got down to the bottom, the heavens just opened up. And you could see waterfalls coming off the side of the mountain. And we had crossed a, a, a ditch, uh, and that was full of water. And Norman was in the front seat with Lee driving, and I was in the back seat with the young fellow. And uh, Norman says, get off the road, because the road was getting very, very muddy. So we were driving on the side of the road. And then when we got to the rushing water, he said, well, you're going to have to gun it and go as fast as you can. <laughs> so water flying everywhere. <laughs> Finally got out on the other side. And uh, anyway, we went through a few more gates, and finally we got back to the pavement. Whew, that was the wildest ride I ever had in my life. And I, I said to, uh, got back on the pavement, and I said to uh, to these guys, I said, uh, I'm very impressed. You guys said a prayer over your ancient shrine, and the heavens opened up. That was the first rain of the monsoon season. <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, this shadow line goes down, and after it gets off to the left there, it just, it's all, everything is, is uh, in the sun, so there's no shadow line. But uh, it comes back later in the year, and it's going from left to right. It's going back across the, uh, the petroglyph. And when the shadow line comes through that cupule, point was my, I'm pointing at the screen, <laughs> right there, um, is four days to where the shadow line is right here, tangent to the circle. I call this a circle dot. Now, <clears throat> uh, I can't think of his name now. He, he was the uh, archaeologist for the city of uh, of, uh, flat, of Phoenix, and he did a lot of work on one of those parks, South Mountain. Todd, uh, Todd yes, Todd Bowsorik. Thank you. Uh, and uh, he published a book on some of that stuff, and I've heard him talk several times. And he says when you when you come across something like this circle dot, uh, look at it carefully. You might want to study what's going on with the sun or the moon or something. And uh, at that site, because that seems to mark uh, something that has to do with uh, maybe a calendar or or uh, marking the uh, uh, summer solstice or whatever it might be. So anyway, so the shadow line is going back up, goes through there, and four days later it's tangent to that circle. I have never seen this circle dot except for the one you showed me. Right. <laughs> um, up here, okay? And, and Richard has a picture of one. It probably means sun in Chinese. In Chinese, yeah. yes. But uh, uh, <clears throat> anyway, in their migration, in the oral history, these uh, uh, Potki clan came from the south migrated and finally joined the Hopis. And what was their uh, their gift to the Hopis to get in was that they brought this ceremony that's done on the equinox uh, about the uh, 
the water serpent and the flood and carrying, let's live properly so this doesn't have, happen again. That's the old story, a very short version of it. Uh, <clears throat> and like I said, this is the only place up here, except for one that Richard showed me, where I've seen this. But it's common down there in the Hohokam, the prehistoric people that lived in the in the valley down there in the Phoenix area. Well, they probably brought that same idea from the south. That's their migration story up here. And it, there it is. And was that a ceremony four days before? Uh, that occurs in September, and I don't know, except for possibly some women's ceremonies, which take place in the fall of the year, uh, might be marking something like that. Now, here's a, uh, in your uh, handout. Uh, Did everybody get a handout? I think so. I got, I got more for me. Anyway, so this is a, a reproduction that I made of the panel uh, on paper. And <clears throat> from the uh, bottom left, the sun in its house, through the circle dot, up to that large short spiral. Playing with the mouse. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> ah, got me, all right. <laughs> from here, oh, can't, I can't do that. Oh. How do I go back to it? There. Okay, so I won't click. Okay. So here, this dot, that dot, that dot, they're all on a straight line, except that one is just above it. But a straight line across that panel. But I'll show you another picture. That This is a flat panel. Uh, it's not, except for where they pecked in to make these uh, images, it's uh, a smooth rock, except where lichen grows on it. So now, ta tangent, uh, 90 degrees to the line going through there. Here I have one, here I have one where it, it goes right there through for the equinox. Here there's the one that goes through here for the uh, sun in its house. That's one of the shadows. One of the shadows. Shadows are decrease. to the yeah. Shadows are to the left of those lines, all the way along. I mean, the, the shadow line goes down that way and comes back again later in the year. So um, where it's hatched, that's that's the shadow line from that rock that I was sitting on. So I think what they probably did was maybe they first put in those cupules and so they had a line there and they wanted to get the face of the north face of the rock i was sitting on that throws the shadow line they wanted to get it fairly straight across there and um also so they had to work that north side to make this all all work and then they probably were using charcoal or something like that to mark on the rock so they could erase it if they need to move it or adjusted whatever and uh i think you know my thinking about it just how did they do that you know get it the right place at the right time for the timing and and the shadow line all that stuff probably took a, more than one generation yeah. to, to do this okay moving on excuse me that so yeah the scratches on the are those actual scratches? No, not not the no. There's no lines there. I'm the, just saying. Well, that maybe this is how they did it. They charcoal lines, and they wanted to get the face of that rock so it's through a fairly straight line. Uh, to well, the, what we see on on these pictures, the, no, the, those there, are scratches in the rock. No, no, no. Well, the straight it, line it's and the, the shadow thrown by the rock. Yeah. Right, but the spiral. Oh, the spiral. Oh, yeah. That's all pecked into the rock. Yeah. Yeah. All those elements, they're all pecked After into the rock. After they use the charcoal to outline it and move yeah, it. Yeah, like, like a chalk on a chalkboard. And wow. If it isn't right, erase it and we'll make it. The next time the sun code does that path, we'll get it straightened out. You know? Wow. So did they live continuously at Shadows Pass? Oh, yeah. For, uh, for more than 200 years. 
Yeah. So now here's how the dagger is formed. Now the over to the left, actually that's the north side of the rock that shows a shadow line, but this is a sun dagger. You could see this part of the spiral where it's illuminated there. Now these are two rocks right next to each other. The bottom rock is just, it doesn't look like it's worked at all, but the top of the rock looks like it was worked. And what they're doing is the top of the dagger is coming off of this line right here. And it doesn't move as the sun rises. So the top of the dagger stays in the same place as the sun rises, but the bottom opens. Okay. We'll see an example of that. For example, this is the sun dagger. Up here, it's just starting to hit the rock uh, as the sun is uh, risen. Now the sun has risen after 15 minutes, and it's bullseye. Bam. Now the top of the dagger is still in the same place, but the bottom of it is opening up. And it's almost across the spiral. And here it's past the spiral, and it's gotten wider. But the top of the dagger is in exactly the same place. And that's 35 minutes after the sun rose. So, again, if you get up late, it's so okay. Is there a there between those dates from May to July? No, no, no. No, this... This is just on this day, oh, okay. May 27, and then when it comes, it goes down to the solstice, which is four rings below the center, uh, and then it comes back on July the 16th okay. at the bullseye. Now, planting time probably for this area is around the end of May, and that's the same time they're planting, starting to plant corn up at Hopi, mm -hmm. which is some, somewhat similar elevation. So that's what I think they were marking. That's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's sur survival. And uh, July 16, what's going on there? Probably the Niman ceremony, which is when the Katsinam go back to where they go to San Francisco Peak or weather after the, uh, the monsoon season begins, like July 9th, for example. Uh, and these guys bless the their ancient shrine. And bam! First yeah. rain of the monsoon season. It doesn't always happen on that day, you know, but that time it did. Yes. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, this is the uh, summer solstice sunrise, June twentieth, two thousand four. Uh, this is West Sunset Mountain. East Sunset Mountain, we were just talking about, is off to the right. This is West Sunset Mountain, and this is the sun just starting to come over the horizon there. So what's happening on the spiral? This is June 20th, 2004. 20 minutes after sunrise, starting to hit over here. This is 30 minutes. This is 40 minutes. And it's tangent to the fourth ring down from the center. Everything happens in fours. That hope be four days in advance, or, or multiples of four. Five, five times four is twenty. The baby naming ceremony after birth is twenty days after birth. Yeah, it's this. Oh, we don't want that on there. Okay, so. Let's see what's next here. Okay. Well, that just to kind of review what I've already said, but I don't need to say it again. Now, what you notice is I'd said nothing about winter solstice. That big rock that I was sitting on, that blocks the winter solstice sunrise from the panel. So when winter solstice sunrise, that panel is all in shade from the rock I was sitting on. But just a little ways down below on a flat rock is this. It's about that big around. Okay. 
with a point on the end. If you line that up, you look across since uh, Chavez Pass to Chavez Mountain, that's pointing to where the winter solstice sun rises. And you can take a stick and do that and line it all up. And, oh, yeah, that's where the winter solstice sun rises. Okay, so I'm sitting on that rock. This is the north side that was throwing. Oh, this is the panel looking down from the, well, on top of it. You can't, I'm looking at the panel, but this is the top of the rock that has all those petroglyphs on it, okay? It's a straight line. Now, put, after they work this, it's it's not a smooth surface and it's not a uh, break like, Basalt tends to break, you know, in very straight lines. So they obviously they work this to make this all work. Okay, now we're going to get a little larger picture of things because we got to see what's going on with the moon. The moon is, has a is, has a very interesting path. So from Chavez Pass, looking east, this is Chavez Mountain. It's actually a mesa. Technical term for a mesa is it's uh, uh, more than five times its height across and it's flat. Well, this is obviously more than five times across and it's flat. It's a mesa. But on the GS, USGS map, it's called Chavez Mountain. That's wrong. They don't follow their own rules. <laughs> uh, so this is East Sunset Mountain. Right over here, highest, second highest point that I was talking about is right there. Highest point again is over here. The uh, summer solstice sunrise occurs right there. And in between these two mountains is sunset paths right there. Now we're down in Sunset Pass to the north and we're looking uh, southwest. Now this is East Sunset Mountain and this is West. And this is Sunset Pass and this is Highway 87 over here going south. And Chavez Pass is right there. That's Sunset Mountain, they say. And that's the end of Anderson Mesa right there and the pass is that notch. So that's just the lay of the land, but I want you to see that because we're gonna get into the moon. Now, the moon goes, full moon rising goes about six, at our latitude goes five to six degrees farther north than the sun ever goes. And it goes five to six degrees uh, farther south than the sun ever goes at winter or summer solstice. So the moon sometimes rises beyond where the summer or winter solstice is. So what's going on? Well, here's what's going on. The moon going around the earth does not stay in the same plane. So for the, they say major, I say maximum. I like that better. Major and minor, that's a major key or minor key, you know. <laughs> but maximum, minimum, okay, I like that better. So, the maximum lunar standstill is when the moon is swinging around out of the plane, the, the plane that it would be if it was not uh, wobbling. Moon, that's the upper illustration. And then it moves down to below that middle line and spends some time there. When it stops there, that's the standstill. When it stops at, stops at the top, doesn't the moon doesn't stop and fall out of the sky? Okay, it doesn't do that. But it, it, when it gets to that that point, which will throw a shadow line or a dagger or whatever you want uh, on the horizon, five to six degrees farther north or south than the sun ever goes. So that's what's going on with the moon. So let's go take a look at it on the horizon. So here we are. Here's looking again from uh, looking east from the calendar site at Chavez Pass. That's Sunset Mountain. And there's East Sunset Mountain. I mean, 
okay. east, Sunset Mountain, and west. So summer solstice sunrise is right there. Winter solstice sunrise is over here. So in six months, the moon on the horizon rises and, and stops over here for about a week. Now we have on the calendar, it says December 21st. Sometimes it's the 20th. Or over here, it's June 21st or maybe the 20th. But for naked eye observation, you can't tell that it's not moving. It's not moving for naked eye observation. It stays there for about seven or eight days. And the Hopis call that Tawaki. That means the sun goes into its house mm -hmm. at the winter and the summer solstice. Mm -hmm. And and starts wow. moving back to the other end after for over six months. Okay, so the uh, azimuth, that is the number of degrees from true north to the summer solstice is about uh, 60 degrees and so, uh, winter solstice is about 120. Um, and that can be different if depending on your latitude where you are north south on the planet. So, and equinox is 90 degrees due east, all right? 90 degrees azimuth from true north. So that's you know, that direction. And I've got the azimuth, you know. And so we've got the maximum and the minimum lunar standstill. It doesn't go as far as the sun goes. And here. So in right now, we just started last December. Full moon rise was moved into the maximum position, right where my pointer is. And now every month, it's moving along that horizon six months. And it comes down here to the maximum position farther than the winter solstice goes. Now, my picture I'm going to show you is the moon over here. Now, what happened? Well, here's how I explain that. The moon rose over the edge of the cliff here, and then it fell down and then jumped up to its position. I'm going to show <laughs> I'm just, Okay, I'm joking, but <clears throat> according to my diagram here, it should be rising right here, but actually I have a picture of the moon when it's right there. It's a little bit further. So I don't know, I'm a little bit off here somehow. Sorry. Not quite perfect. So let's see. Yeah, that's the next one. Okay. That's the moon rising in the maximum southern standstill position. Okay. So I have another one when it was right here in this street. Anyway. So it stays. Okay. So the standstill is uh, about two years. I mean, this whole cycle is 18.6 years. So the standstill is about two years long. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sun on the horizon, the standstill or solstice, it's Latin for sun stop, um, is uh, about seven or eight days, okay, for naked eye observation. Now, this is a very faint moonrise because there's so many clouds right there where the pointer is. That's the maximum lunar standstill. This is West Sunset Mountain. So it's done a long swing, came back from that moon position I just showed you in six months back to this position. Okay. Anything else there? Uh, I'm confused. You're saying it's going from. Uh, uh, let's say west to east in six months no it's but this is all east but okay. it's going from about that there is 55 about 55 as degrees azimuth five degrees further north than the sun ever goes i'm confused what are you talking about that it does during six months versus yeah. where it does in nine years oh yeah okay so in six months it goes all the way down across to that moon picture I just showed you. Uh -huh. And then six months, it comes back to this position. It does that for two years. Then it starts moving 
back to the minimum position over a period of nine years. And then it's swinging inside of where the sun goes okay. back and forth six months. So six months. the nine years comes in just between the two, two standstills. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, the moon follows the sun. Wherever the sun rises, mm -hmm. the moon will be well, somewhere close to it. Well, <clears throat> yeah. Actually, what's, what's okay. interesting is this is taken in De December 15. That's the closest the to the solstice winter solstice. Here. So the winter solstice is way off to the right here. And that's when the moon is opposite. And then they switch positions in the summer in the back to the winter. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. Okay, so where do we go next? Oh, I love this. This is a picture taken. I think that's me being silhouetted against, looks like a burning juniper tree. Mm -hmm. The tree is not burning. It's, I went up here in, uh, this is a full moon rise, December of 2019. And, yeah. Um, and that's the moonrise right there, not a sunrise. That's the moonrise. And up here, the sun is still shining through the atmosphere. That's why it's pink up here. And this blue line right there, that's the Earth's shadow projected against the eastern horizon, sun setting in the west. You can often see that if everything is just right. It's really right. spectacular. Sometimes this is more spectacular. Than the sunset. <laughs> yeah. So there's clouds up there, and so the sun is still shining through the atmosphere. Yeah. And then that's the Earth's shadow right there. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. And then uh, the guy that came with us uh, is, I think it's his name is LaRue. He lives down at the end of the street where uh, I live on. And he went with us. He's a friend of Scott Thibony. Scott took this picture. And uh, yeah, so he started a fire, a little fire with just some dry brush on the ground. And with a, uh, I don't know if he did it with a flint or if he did it with a uh, wood on wood. Mojo. Yeah, going and I walked over there. Wow, that's cool. And then Scott was, Man, that's an awesome picture. <laughs> now, that's the sun setting at the same time. And uh, this is in the shadow, actually, but it looks like it's illuminated. It's not illuminated with flash. This is uh, Tony Marinella, who, when I started with the Museum of Northern Arizona, I worked with him. He was the photo archivist and the photographer for the museum. Today, he's a, a nighttime photographer in Phoenix area. He does a lot of architectural stuff, especially at night. And uh, I asked him to come up and uh, help me out with getting some pictures at night. So he taught, shot this of the sunset. He turned this in, this was made on a print. Uh, it was a, it came out about this size that he had in a gallery in downtown Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. But this is what I wanted to show you. That right there is a lunar dagger wow. on the spiral at the northern minimum lunar standstill. So five, six degrees further south than the sun ever goes at the minimum standstill. The... Uh, moon shows a dagger at the top of the spiral. Mm -hmm. That means that when it goes to the northern lunar maximum position, it's going about 11, 12 degrees farther north, and it's going farther, rising farther north than the sun ever goes on the horizon, and the, and the uh, dagger is going to be down here somewhere. So actually... We went out there this December, which uh, again is the beginning of the maximum lunar standstill. We're walking up to the top where this where this petroglyph panel is, 
And I'm that's my bag right there with a little red on it. And this is uh, last name is Pat Patterson. Can't remember. He works for the Forest Service. And he's we're just walking up there. From where we park our car in the pass, it might be half a mile to two thirds of a mile walk up here, and it's four hundred feet elevation gain to get up here. And next, this is Joanne. Yeah, she's right behind me in that previous picture. This is the first petroglyphs you see as you're getting close to the calendar pen. Four people with hands, looks like they're dancing or something. Stick figures. There's a fifth one, is that? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that is. I can't <clears throat> quite figure out what that is. Anyway, maybe he's got a drum and he's, they're dancing to the drum. I don't know. That's Joanne, I'm telling So when we got up here, the sun was setting. This is in the shadow. And we're waiting for the moon to rise. Now, here's the problem. I've been out here with three people that said they could get a picture of the lunar dagger. They have these fancy phones like you guys carry around. I have just have a flip phone. <laughs> uh, just, and they say, oh yeah, we can get a picture of that. No problem. I haven't seen a picture yet. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm going to have to help you out with yeah, that one. Yeah. So, uh, I I brought a a, a a tape measure along with me this time because I wanted to marry, measure the dagger up here to where the dagger was at the maximum. Okay. Now you can see it with your naked eye, but nobody could get get a picture of it <laughs> but it was 11 and a half inches from here to the fourth ring down that is the top of the sun dagger at summer solstice and then another 11 and a half inches down because that's the midpoint between the maximum and minimum lunar standstills okay same place as the summer solstice dagger and that's what I was trying to get these guys out there and get a picture of it. Okay, so the next one. Okay, so we're coming down from one, two, three, fourth ring down. And this tape measure is at the top of the dagger when the flash is not flying, <laughs> wiping it out. That is right along the top, and that's 11 and a half inches down the here. Right. So, yeah, summer solstice dagger is the same position as the midpoint or the equinox of the lunar cycle. Kind of interesting. Okay. Now, in 2005, November 18, uh, this was the beginning of the pre previous uh, maximum, the actual lunar dagger right there. This is a flashlight shining on the spiral. But if I didn't have a flashlight shining on the spiral, this would be all black. Oh, couldn't see anything. All you could see is this. You don't know where it is. And again, you can measure from here to that point and from there to the top, and that's exactly the same distance. But I captured this with black and white film with a film camera in 2005, uh, fastest speed, uh, ASA of 800, and then we Develop, pushed the development so it was about 1600 and uh, and that's why we got this picture 
Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so sometimes the old stuff works oh. better than the <laughs> new stuff. <laughs> okay. So now this uh, we didn't get exactly this. We were talking too much. We forgot the moon was rising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was December, uh, whatever that says down here. 15th? 15th, looks like. 2000. 2005. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, again, oh, that, that was the same one that we had that looked like the tree on fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. there's, there's the sun still making the cloud pink up there. And the earth shadow kind of blends into the cloud out there so a little bit later because we had the picture there was just a smudge of moon right there so we had risen that far mm -hmm. and after all this heavy work you're walking back there if you're out there for a sunrise or a moonrise um you know you get out there and you're you go out there in the dark but after you you see what's going on up there. Then you're walking back down, and the sun is up. And there, the the mesa there, it uh, the lower part of the mesa is kaibab limestone. The next layer is the monkopi sandstone, and then there's a basalt cap, okay, where the the panel is. Okay, and as you walk down, you come into the kaibab limestone. And then there's a whole section there of cliff rose. Mm -hmm. Cliff rose only goes on, grows on alkaline soil, like derived from. Limestone. And I, if there's a lot of cliff rose growing mm -hmm. there. Yeah, and when they're blooming, they got these little. <laughs> Yellowish, yellowish white flowers, just like this. It's nicely more yellow than that. I have a couple of those in my front yard. But sometimes they'll bloom. If it's a good year, they'll bloom uh, in the spring. And then they'll bloom after the monsoon season, maybe twice a year. And sometimes, I don't know, if, uh, I've hardly seen any pollinators this, this year. But uh, normally, when you come down, and they're blooming like this. You can hear the plants before you can see them because they're buzzing yeah. bees. <laughs> so that's that's it, folks. <laughs> so, question: How far away was the? Can you get rid of this? Yeah. From. Where that spiral rock was. Okay, how far what? The village where they live, the town. Oh, it's just down below on the ridge. I would say it would take you, well, the whole area is choked with uh, overabundance of pinion and juniper now. But back in those days, they'd probably used a lot of that for firewood as well as uh, building material for roofs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, would probably take you 20 minutes to walk down to the first Pueblo on the ridge. So somebody had to walk up there and they yeah. found this rock with the cleft over here that made the shadow. Yeah. And worked on it, like you said. Yeah. To... And shaped the rock to make a shadow line across. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> can, can we go back to your... Um, Lunar cycle slide. And yeah. Does it that live? <laughs> sure. He's got to get it down. I, I totally. Uh, <laughs> I had a misconception about that from, uh, you know, seeing what I've seen about the hot of heat yeah. and how they tracked it on the spiral of the hot of heat. Right. And I had a misconception about. You know how that actually works. What, yeah. what works. slide did you want to go back to? I'll keep going. The drawing of the yeah. lunar side. That, that one. You yeah. just passed it. That one or the next one? Next one. Next one. Okay. 
Next. No, back. That, yeah. one. that one. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, can I so is this, stand up? Sure. Yeah. I thought that, like at Bahana Heath, that they tracked the moon um, coming up every year, going like this for nine years, no. and then going back every year for no. nine years. No, what they tracked the, is is the maximum position and the minimum. So in six months, it goes from here to, to there. there. And back the next six months uh -huh. when it's uh, winter solstice there over here. Yeah, at uh, when you're in this position, it's summer solstice. Okay. In this position. Okay. Then nine years yeah. later, the it's been rising along for years. And for nine years, nine it rises years. right here nine, yeah, for right. nine years. Yeah. And then back. And then back. Gotcha. Okay. Now, okay. Now, here, they, this is blocked by the rock that throws the shadow over here. So they don't. Uh -huh. Okay. So you get back. Okay. Nine years in there. That's so there. that's 18 years from here to here. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I totally misperceived that. Yeah. Too, Bob, not going to explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> the student becomes my kid. <laughs> well, let me just that on the hot of you. This should have nine turns on it, but it only has seven, so it's easier to see, I guess. But so the. This is in shadow at the minimum lunar standstill. So the moon is rising and it's hitting an opening in those slabs. As the moon rises, it, it, uh, this is a shadow line over here. And this is in the moonlight over here. Nine years later, it's moved farther north and it's shining a uh -huh. Like way over here, yeah. and the shadow is over here. But it's okay. done all of that just on that one end. Yeah. In nine yeah. years. Yeah. But in the every northern six position. months, it goes back, back and forth to here. Right. Mm -hmm. It swings. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. crazy. It's a little yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> is this site open to the public? Oh, yeah. 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 It's on the National Forest. Yeah, now when I published this article on the solar part of it, um, I had uh, Peter Pellis uh, review, he's the archaeologist, was, he's about retired, uh, had him, you know, review it. And I think I might have, I might have been more specific about where this was. He says, no, just make it. I just call it the yeah. Chavez calendar. Yeah. Don't say where it is. Somewhere yeah. out there. Yeah. 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 You're right. Yeah. I've 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 done uh, you know uh, guided tours out there, and uh, and there was one he had students with him. He was teaching a class, and I don't remember where he was, what school he was from, but he was teaching a class in archaeoastronomy, and uh, so he. Uh, called me up and said, can you take me to the site with my students? I said, yeah, sure. And then we had a conference at Flagstaff, a Aurora conference, American Rock Art Research Association. I remember that group. Anyway, we had a annual conference in Flagstaff and then we had field trips. <clears throat> so I did two or three field trips uh, out mm -hmm. to that site. Mm -hmm. But I, I really don't want to take people out there in the dark or have to come back in the dark. Right. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> lights, but yeah, you can fall down. And, you know, when there's no trail, it's all bushwhacking, isn't it? Uh, we follow a uh, barbed wire fence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not really a trail. You're still picking your way through it. Sure. A lot of mm -hmm. stuff to trip um, over. Well, I thought maybe you took guided tours up there with everybody blindfolded so they could <laughs> so find their way back. Yeah. When was it? When was there's, there's, a, there's a rock art site there that, that uh, it's just amazing. 
It's a little farther north on the east face of uh, Anderson Mesa. And did I get the other it's to go for. So I, I always take people there because uh, once we get up, if, if we're there for a moon or sunrise, and then after we're through looking at the solar panel, we go to the southern side. It's amazing. It's, it's got another, it's got a birthing petroglyph, it's got concentric circles, it's got spiral circles. But none of them have any uh, uh, calendric function. But they got some wild petroglyphs there. Just amazing. Well, Jerry, I want to thank you for your uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, your talk. You. That was extremely interesting. Yeah. yeah. So. Well. I'll go ahead and uh, end the meeting right here.